So let's see. Can you hear me, Terry? Hi, Brett. How are you? Good. How are you? Doing good. Sounds like you're blasting between two presentations here. Yeah. Uh, the one with Blackwater Falls Astronomy Weekend, that's been planned for several months. So it went just a little bit long, but it was a good, it was a good presentation. Yeah. Are your skies clear down there? We're clear, but we've got a little bit of uh, the transparency is not that great. There's not a cloud in the sky, but we've got some milky, uh, just some milky, hazy. Yeah. Right now. Hey Brent, uh, your video's not on. Um, I want to just... did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's... I, I'm in the middle of the mountains right now, and the Wi-Fi here is not fantastic. Okay, so you're just on. gonna you're gonna be audio only, I guess. Let me, let me turn the uh, video on and see. And I'm in, sitting in front of a window, which is not good. But this oh, is I'm in Blackwater. Nice. I'm at Blackwater like Falls. <laughs> looks nice. I mean, yeah, the skies look milky, but yeah. They're definitely milky, but uh, let me let me turn around so I don't have that background glare. At least it's not raining. No, no, we're, we're going to have a great weekend weather-wise. Yeah, that's good. So hopefully the video stream won't cause uh, any stuttering or anything. So far, it sounds all right. If it starts giving you trouble, we just shut off your video and see if that helps any. Or, you know, if you're more comfortable with the video shut off, however you want to do it, it's fine. Okay. Brent, uh, are you able to put like um, uh, some sort of uh, book or books underneath your laptop to raise it up so that we're not getting a. Uh, something like you're looking down at like, the audience. Or, something like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let me go. Uh, yeah, I can. It's just more, it's kinder to the audience, that's all. Okay, we are going to start going live. Your microphones will be hot, so whatever you say, the audience will hear it. And um, It's amazing how quiet it gets at this time. <laughs> Yeah. Carol, are you back there somewhere? Okay, we are live now. Okay. We are live now. So, yeah, and we have an audience already. Beatrice Hines from Belgium is here. Harold Locke, Norm Hughes. Uh, it's nice to see some of the regulars here. Yeah, How do definitely. You? Wasn't Norm at Starmus? Uh, I don't know that he was. Oh. So with this format, will I be able to, um, I have some questions I wanted to ask participants. Will I be able to Oh yeah. Them or how did, how is that? Uh, so what you do, Molly, is uh, if you have a separate computer, which is the best way to do this, is you go to um, you can go on to the Facebook uh, uh, Astronomical League Live or Astronomical League page, or better uh, to go to the Explore Scientific official page on YouTube because you'll see all the chats coming in from all the different simulcasts, including Astronomical League's page. Uh, and then you can chat with them. Um, uh, you won't, they're not gonna be talking, they'll, they'll be chatting with us, but they're chatting right now, so. Let me run and grab another one. Yeah, yeah, but you want the audio, you want the audio turned off on your, yeah. um, on that other, you know, microphone and and speakers, so you don't get echoes here. So, hi, John. How are you? Yeah, <laughs> I'm doing I know fine. I saw thank Carol. you. There's Carol popped in. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi Carol. Carol.
Grant, I'd like to be down at Black. I've never been to Blackwater Falls Star or Astronomy Weekend. It's, it's nice. It's a little uh, smaller in scale compared to Green Bank, but yeah. it's a nice location. I bet. Is it up in the? Is it in the hills? Is are you in a little more altitude or not? Yeah, yeah, we're higher than uh, Green Bank. Uh, yeah. Where I am right now, we're probably about thirty-four hundred feet. Um, but there's places you can go around here. You get up, you know, 4,100 feet, a little 4,200 feet. And Spruce Knob is not that far away. Oh, okay. Which is the darkest location in the state. And it's about uh, 48, 4,800 feet. Wow. I've never been there either. I'd like to do that sometime. Yeah, that's a great place. I bet. And the I've heard nothing but good. I've heard nothing but good stuff about both star parties or both, you know, astronomy get togethers. I was at the Blackwater Falls uh, Star Party a number of years ago, and it, it's really good. The skies are very dark. Um, it was cold. It, <laughs> it was really cold, but uh, the yeah. skies were excellent. Yeah, there I must be. It's already been in the 30s here. Yeah. Uh, there... To me, it seemed like it was, it was in the minus 30s, but you're probably <laughs> right. There must be places to stay besides just camping, then, right? Because mm -hmm. Brent, you're you're inside, so yes, I'm in one of the uh, family cabins. Okay, uh, it's a four bedroom. Oh wow! It has a nice, nicely equipped kitchen, fireplace, uh, a large main room, and then four separate uh, bedrooms. Wow! And they have a number of these cabins around here at Blackwater, and then about ten miles down the road is Canaan Valley Resort. And they have cabins as well. They have a, a big lodge. There's a big lodge of black water. And then uh, camping, uh, as well as Airbnbs and rentals, because it's a ski, it's a ski area. Is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Tom Statler, and I work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., where I'm the program scientist for the DART mission. The DART mission is humanity's first attempt to change the motion of a celestial body. And the reason we're doing this is to test our ability to protect the Earth from an impact by an asteroid if we should ever discover in the future an asteroid that is headed on a collision course for Earth. Planetary defense is about making sure that a rock from space doesn't send us back to the Stone Age. And the key parts of planetary defense are, first of all, finding the asteroids that are potentially hazardous to the Earth. And we understand where about 40% of those asteroids are. We know that no known asteroid is a danger to the Earth right now. But the concern is about the asteroids we don't know about yet. And if we should ever discover an asteroid that's on a collision course with Earth, we want to be able to discover this years in advance so we can give the asteroid a push, not to destroy it, we probably wouldn't be able to do that anyway, but just to prevent that collision. And the DART mission, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, is our first test of one way of doing that. DART's going to a binary asteroid, a double asteroid, for two really good reasons. The little asteroid, Dimorphos, which is in orbit around the big asteroid, Didymos, that asteroid is about the size of object that we would, we would tend to be concerned about. The most abundant asteroids are the small ones, and this one, about 160 meters across, or about the size of a football stadium, is large enough that it really would cause severe damage if it struck the Earth. Now, by impacting by doing our experiment, the kinetic impact experiment on the small moonlit asteroid, we're able to measure our effectiveness in deflecting the asteroid by watching the change in the orbit of the little asteroid around the big one. It makes that measurement a lot more precise and a lot easier to do with telescopes on Earth. 
The other reason we're doing it is that the presence of the large asteroid there keeps the little one in orbit around it as the pair go around the sun. So that means that this asteroid, which is not a danger to Earth now, will never become a danger to the Earth because of anything that we do in the dark mission. No asteroid that we know of now is a danger to the Earth. And the Didymos, Didymos asteroid that DART is going to, that also is not a danger to the Earth, and there's nothing that we could do to it that will make it a danger to the Earth. But the possibility of an asteroid large enough that it could affect huge numbers of people, uh, the, the likelihood of that happening during our lifetimes is there. It's not a high probability. But um, we take precautions about low probability events all the time. It's a low probability that your house will burn down, for example, but you take precautions to make sure that that doesn't happen and you have fire insurance. Anyone who wants to know about DART can follow on social media by using the hashtag DART mission or by looking at nasa.gov slash DART mission. At the moment of impact with Dimorphos, DART will be moving at about four miles per second. That's about 15,000 miles an hour. The important thing isn't how far we move the asteroid, it's how much we change its speed by. So we're going to change the speed of the asteroid by only a few millimeters per second. It's far, far smaller than walking speed. But the idea in planetary defense is that if there is a hazardous asteroid, a dangerous asteroid, and we discover it years in advance, then a change in its velocity that tiny, given time to add up, given time to work, can make the difference between an impact on Earth and a safe miss. NASA's planetary defense strategy is to do several things at the same time. The most important one is to search for asteroids because we only know about 40% of the population of asteroids that could be dangerous and we need to find that other 60%, track them, establish their orbits around the sun and figure out which ones could be dangerous to us now or in the future. Also, like in the DART mission, we want to develop the technologies for deflecting asteroids, mitigating the effects of the asteroid hazard and then we want to be working with other federal agencies, state and local governments, and governments worldwide uh, to understand how the worldwide community can deal with this issue of planetary defense and protect the entire world, share information, transmit off, uh, information up the chain to the decision makers, do what's necessary to respond to an actual asteroid danger if there is, ever is one. DART is carrying a small CubeSat, it's called the Riccia Cube, it was contributed by the Italian Space Agency, and its job basically is to watch the impact from a little distance away. It's riding along on the DART spacecraft and it's going to be deployed a few days before the kinetic impact. Uh, it's going to maneuver and offset itself to the side so that it doesn't run into the same asteroid that DART is running into, and it's got two cameras on it that are going to try to first catch the actual impact of DART on camera, but then more importantly, uh, see the ejecta, the plume of material that's blown off the surface of the asteroid and how that develops. If we're fortunate, we'll be able to see the impact crater newly formed by the DART impact. And then of course, Leach Cube is going to do something that DART can't do, that is fly past the asteroid, look back and get the full three-dimensional shape of the object that we hit, which we won't know until we actually get there. Mm. One of my favorite things about DART is the name. It's the double asteroid redirection test. And we're going to a double asteroid. It's a binary asteroid, but we're also doing a double test. DART is a test of our ability to actually execute a kinetic impact build a spacecraft that can autonomously, autonomously direct itself to, to a collision with an asteroid. But also we have to 
uh, test how a real asteroid responds to that deflection attempt. Because it's one thing to take a very expensive spacecraft and smash it to bits on the surface of an asteroid, but really the question we want to answer is how effectively do we move an asteroid when we do that? So DART is a double test on a double asteroid. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific and the Explore Alliance, and it's our honor to introduce uh, Terry Mann and the executive staff of uh, the Astronomical League, and David Levy and their special guests, uh, Brent Maynard and Molly Wasser. Uh, really excited about this particular uh, episode because this is the 20th Astronomical League Live. Turn it over to you, Terry. Thank you for having me on again. Hey, thank you for having us on again, Scott. It's good to see you back. Yeah, like I, I'm, I'm a little wobbly, a little woozy, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's, and we're going to our Arizona Dark Sky Star Party leaving tomorrow. So uh, that should be another great event to see this city and the village or township of Oracle celebrate their dark skies. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so no, thank you. Not. Yep. So, all right. Well, thank you. And actually, I am going to go to David Levy next. And David, you will be at the star party in Arizona too, won't you? Yes, I certainly will. I won't be able to be there the entire time because I've become a full-time caretaker in the last few days. However, I do plan to come for one of the days and one of the evenings. And uh, we just need to decide which one. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I bet so. I Thank you, Terry. And uh, usually what I do at this point is to do my quotation. Before I do that, I have written approximately 40 books in my lifetime. I'd like to introduce you to book number 40, which came out two days ago. Wow. Oh, wow. Here it is. It is called Clipper, Cosmos, and Children, Finding <clears throat> the Eureka Moment. It's by me with our original artwork by Joan Ellen Rosenthal. Wow. Who happens to be my sister-in-law and who is visiting us and helping us care for Wendy right now. So we're all together. It was published by RJI Publishing in out of New Mexico, and the book will be selling for $20. Wow. And, uh, Excellent. Uh, yeah, it looks great. In a couple of hours, you can read to a child in a few days, or if you're a child and want to read it yourself, you can read it in a day or two. And I hope you'll enjoy it. Oh, I'm sure we will. I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, now for the quotation. And I believe I've done this one before, but I think I can think of no more appropriate one right now. Because on Monday, Queen Elizabeth, the late Queen Elizabeth II, is going to be buried. We have a new king in England, King Charles III. Interesting name he chose, his own name, King Charles because Charles II was okay, but Charles I had a very rough reign. It ended with Oliver Cromwell taking over and with him being executed. Oh. So one hopes that Charles III <clears throat> will have a more happy and successful and long-term reign over the uh, British Commonwealth of Nations. Um, William, you know, I have a number of books in my, because I got my doctorate degree on the night sky and the works of William Shakespeare and others. And uh, one of the things that the Oxford Shakespeare says right at the beginning is that some say that Shakespeare partook of the divine. And I think a lot of you would be angry to hear that. How can any writer partake of the divine? But what I'm going to do in this quote is tell you how and give you an example. Um, Shakespeare was sitting in his office in his room with a quill pen, either that or he had Microsoft Word version minus 50, in which he was trying to write a speech. And he's thinking, what is Macbeth going to say after he finds out that his wife has died? <clears throat> and he can't think of anything. He's just sitting there. He's agonizing over this. And then there's a tap on his shoulder. And he's wondering, you know, who's disturbing me? And he turns around. And there, standing behind him, is God. And God says, Will, I'm here. Take a break, get a cup of coffee, have a beer, relax, I got this. 
And uh, what, what Shakespeare wrote under the guidance of the divine, I believe, is this speech. And a little bit about the speech, it is about space and time. <clears throat> and you might say that he's anticipating by four centuries the concept of space-time and Einstein's general relativity. So in honor of that, I will add one line to the, to the quotation. And so the uh, assistant comes up to him and says, the queen, my lord, is dead. And Macbeth looks at him and he looks like he's given up completely. And he says, she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets its hour across, across the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, but signifying nothing, signifying everything. Mm -hmm. Thank you and back to you, Terry. Thanks for letting me do this. Hey, you're welcome anytime, David. We enjoy you being here. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Give our best to Wendy. Definitely. All right. Uh, how about Carol? We haven't heard from you in a while, and I haven't seen you since Albuquerque. Uh, There's a little, going little bit going on. <laughs> and for a uh, start, I'd like to congratulate David on the new book. That really sounds exciting. <clears throat> uh, I send my regards to uh, Wendy as well. Uh, we pray for her soon, uh, feeling much better. Uh, yeah, it's been two months since we just concluded our Alcon uh, 2022. And it was a very successful convention, had a ton of good speakers. And one of the things we did this time was to have a uh, virtual type convention alongside it with interviews, thanks to Scott and uh, Explore Scientific. Uh, in addition, we broadcast live the uh, awards banquet, which was new territory for us. We'd never done that before. And I've uh, gotten a, quite a bit of feedback from <laughs> league members uh, within the last couple of weeks about how much they enjoyed it and also how much they would really like the idea of having a virtual convention as part of it. And we've talked about this before. So I think the odds are very good, provided Scott is agreeable, <laughs> that we will uh, Push that uh, even harder for of course. Baton Rouge <laughs> in yeah. 2023 because there is definitely a need for it. Uh, I received a uh, an email from one of our members, I believe it's in Florida, saying that uh, he has a hearing issue and crowds really uh, aggravate that situation. He says I've never attended an Alcon, but he says I listened to the virtual one back in 2021, every word of it. And he says, I really encourage you to pursue uh, that venture because it's uh, very helpful to, on lots of levels to many people. So I think uh, that feedback is very important that we're getting there. Another thing that happened at Alcon 2022 in Albuquerque was uh, many things, but I just want to highlight the diversity panel we had. Uh, and that was to just see what the, the membership is thinking as far as uh, we're doing a good job of reaching out to the different groups of people who maybe are misrepresented or underrepresented in the league. And we got some very good insight on that. And I think you'll see some positive developments coming from that and the must to follow. Um, let's see. The Alcon uh, 2023 committee is hard at work. Uh, we've uh, got the loose ends pretty much uh ready to go and so you'll be hearing much more about that convention very soon uh, one thing i would like to mention is that if any of our league members listening tonight uh have had experience that, uh, in advertising that they would like to share with the league we are needing some help uh we have an opening for an ad representative and we would really like to talk to you if you have those kind of skills to uh maybe uh, volunteer for this volunteer position. If anyone out there is interested, 
if you would email me at president at astroleague.org and express your interests and we will follow up on that. So hopefully we'll get some comments on that. <clears throat> and that's about it. I know we're getting, we're continuing to get people out there under the, under the skies doing lots of observing. And that's always encouraging. Uh, our uh, membership continues to stay around 22,000 members and compliments of the COVID and lots of other things. But we have really uh, noticed a convergence of uh, uh, not only increased membership, but increased demand for uh, uh, telescopes and related instruments. So that's all good. So there, I think the future looks bright for astronomy and the Astronomical League, and uh, we're looking forward to it. And with that, back to you, Terry. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, there were a lot of Master Observer plaques also. We had a I'm lot glad of you mentioned that. We gave out, I think, yeah. 17, uh, 17 uh, Master Observer uh, badges, uh, uh, plaques. Uh, and of course, we uh, teased the local people in Albuquerque about uh, having about two thirds of those. Uh, yeah. It's amazing what dark skies can do as far as your ability <laughs> to go out there and observe uh, on a weekly basis, except for the monsoon that happens occasionally. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think Scott, I love Scott's interview with Harrison Schmidt. That yeah. that was amazing. Just yes. to meet him, he was so nice, and his wife was just amazingly nice. Yeah. You know, it was it was amazing. I mean, I can't find another word. Just sitting at the table talking with them, you know, at dinner time, it it was something else. To I mean, it, they were just like everybody else that you meet. And I guess you don't expect that when the man has walked on the moon. You know, it's just amazing. And what impressed me also was that uh, he's at a certain age and yeah. he is totally uh, oh, yeah. uh, current with all that's going on in the field of astronomy and space. He's right there. So that was very yeah. encouraging. And his talk was amazing. He, he was our keynote at the banquet. And his talk, he had such a great sense of humor. And just some of the stuff he showed, it was amazing. So I, I really enjoyed all the speakers. Uh, Michael Backage did a talk about the 2024 eclipse. Uh, we had a lot of vendors. We really had quite a few vendors, which really made it fun because you always had something to do between the talks. So I'm looking forward to Baton Rouge and see what we're going to run into there. Yep, I think it'll be good. Yep, I think so. Well, thank you very much, Carol, and I'm sure we'll be talking soon. Sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. John Goss, are you just about wound up and ready to go? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I don't know what you're even going to be speaking about tonight, John. Do you know what you're going to speak that, about? That, that, makes, that makes two of us. I'll, I'll, think real, <laughs> I'll think real fast on this one. okay no, I, actually okay. i do i did i have given it some some thought and i'd like to start in with a powerpoint of course <clears throat> maybe do i still have it yes uh, i hope everybody can see this yes um yeah i i have i i really have given this talk some thought except uh for the title um i just jotted this title down uh, just a uh, half hour ago or so, but it occurs to me that that's exactly what this whole night is about. It's about the moon and, and the, the fall skies. I mean, you know, fall is a really good time for getting out to observe. You have the earlier sunset, of course, but a lot of parts of the country finally have the sweltering summer humidity swept away and you have nice, clear, crisp skies. And I'm glad to say that that's pretty much occurring where I am right now. And I bet you that uh, Brent Maynard, who's on the screen also, he's probably seeing some pretty good skies right right now. We've had a whole uh, four or five, six days of really, really clear weather. And this is, is a, a, a great time to look at the moon, especially um, right at the end of September, first part of October. And I'd like to jump into a little bit about that. Um, first of all, well, last of all, uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, uh, International uh, Observe the Moon Night. Uh, I'm not going to say much about that, but we do have a speaker who will. But I'd like to start off by talking about the International Library Telescope Observing Week, which is, is the last week of September. 
And some of you uh, may not know what the Library Telescope is and, and what, what, what's this all about. I'll briefly describe it since this talk really isn't about this program. The idea is that, a, that an astronomy club um, sponsors a small telescope to be posted, placed in their local library. People can check out the telescope. Patrons can check it out just as they do books. You know, for a week or two, I don't, I don't know what the, what the circulation rules are for that particular library, but for a week or two, take it home. It's highly portable, <clears throat> easy to use. Uh, it, it's small, but it is large enough to, for the newcomer to get some pretty good views of the, of the heavens. Uh, one of those views is the moon, which we'll talk about here in, in just another minute or so. Uh, of course, you can see Saturn and, and moons of Jupiter and so on. And um, when the patron's done with it, they return it and move on, goes on to the next person. But this is a great way for kids and, uh, to get interested in amateur astronomy with uh, little or no cost themselves. You know, if they like the hobby, they can go out and buy their own telescope, you know, call up Scott Roberts and he'll take care of them then. I'll so, do my uh, best. <laughs> yeah, he'll do, it. he'll do his best. But really, uh, and I know this works, uh, the, the club that I belong to, the one in Roanoke, Virginia, one of our members, um, a, a young man, got started this way, I don't know, two or three years ago, um, and maybe four, four years ago or so now. And I think now he has moved on to an eight-inch mm -hmm. dump sunny, and, and he is really interested in amateur astronomy. He saw Neptune for the first time a couple of years ago, and to him, that was a really big deal. And it was, he was pretty excited about it. So this is a great, great way to get in, into the hobby. It's enough I'm gonna say, say about that, except that we do have a special um, week at the end of September to look at the moon with, with this telescope. If your library has one and doesn't have a program for looking at the moon, uh, bug them, bug them about this because this is a, a great time of year to do that. So the moon on October 1st, what, what, what can you see? Well, you know, of course, we could spend two hours talking about what, what's, what you could see, but we're just going to briefly go over some of this stuff. Uh, Maria, okay, these, these are the, the, the flat plains, a uh, whole bunch of craters, mountains, the Apollo landing, uh, Apollo 11 landing site, um, which is everyone wants to see to see, see where it all started. That you'd be able to see on October 1st. The league is pretty interested in, in spotlighting the moon too. It has a number of observing programs, uh, everything from the, from the beginner to the uh, more advanced to uh, kind of putting it all together. We have a lunar evolution program, which I'm, I personally am working on, on right now and enjoying it a lot, tying all this stuff together and learning about, about the moon. And we offer a, here's a, a shameless ad for you. We're offering a, a new manual called uh, Car Carpe, Lu Carpe Lunum, which describes these lunar programs and some activities in those uh, to, to, to get you going. And I'm gonna be talking about one, one of those in just a moment, but this is a, a great way to get started. So on October 1st, you know, what, what's one of the things you can see? Well, what I decided to prepare um, was talking about the, the crater of Theophilus. You know, it's, it's a nice looking crater. It's easy to see. It'll be easy to see on October 1st. And uh, I thought we'd talk about it a little bit. Before we go any further, you can see that this sketch I have on there is by Cindy Cratch. Uh, that's the first place sketching award for this past year. And she did an ex excellent job. So good, so good that none other than Sky and Telescope has it featured on their September cover. And when I got it in the mail and I looked at that, I thought, what? You know, I've seen, I've seen that before. <laughs> And thank you, Cindy, That's a, that was a great job, a, a great sketch. Um, in a way, I don't like showing sketches like this because it may discourage people, because this is very good. But uh, you'd be surprised that with just a little bit of effort, um, as far as sketching goes, uh, the type of product that, that you can produce. So you might, might wanna give it a chance. So let's talk about Theophilus and how it was formed. When I look at the moon, um, you know, we've all seen the moon, the craters and so on. Um, but I like thinking about how this stuff really happened, how it was formed, what it all means, how it all came, came to be. Well, a crater like Theophilus uh, suffered an impact, uh, you know, four billion years ago. 
by an asteroid or a meteoroid that was, so let's say 10 kilometers in diameter, smacked into it pretty good, excavated the surface, tossed out all, a lot of stuff all over the place. Short time later, like a minute later, the mantle underneath the, uh, the crust rebounded, popping up a mountain, a central mountain. And a lot of times if these uh, asteroids were big enough, they left giant cracks in the crater that later day filled at a, sometime in the, in the future filled with magma. So that's pretty much how a crater like a Theophilus came into being. And you can see some of this stuff when, when, when we look at, at the picture here in just a few minutes. One thing, these craters or mountains or whatever feature on the moon, it, it kind of begs you to think about how tall they are how high the, the, the crater walls are, how tall the individual uh, peaks are in a mountain range. And you think, gosh, you know, that, that seems to be pretty easy to fix, to, to, to figure out, figure out. Well, how, how would you go about doing that? The, you know, if you know a little bit of a simple high school trigonometry, and I'm talking simple, a little bit on, on figuring out cosines and tangents, that's really all we're getting into. You can do this, but there's a big problem. Um, conceptually, it seems pretty easy, but what you need to know is that the, um, the effects of lunar libration do not um, lend, them, lend themselves to easy calculations here, simply because the, uh, the center of the lunar disk is not at the uh, zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude point on the disk, and that affects the solar angle uh, uh, I might be getting more into than what I want to talk about right here, but into the to the uh, subsolar point of the disk, which is where you want uh, the sun to be to find the length of the shadows. And I'm going to skip all this because we're going to go on to sh I'll show you how to do it. So we got to have a strategy. Really, when you, when you talk about uh, tangents of, of an angle, you have to know how high something is and how far away it is. Well. It just so happens by, by nice, a nice coincidence here, at the terminator, the angle of the sun above the horizon is zero because that's the night day horizon line right there. That's, that it's zero. So what you wanna do is be able to figure out the surface distance uh, right at the terminator um, for each degree longitude. And there's a simple formula to do that, which I've given here, that it's the cosine of the latitude which we'll, we'll talk about here in a moment, uh, times pi times the diameter of the moon divided by 360 degrees. It's a pretty simple formula once you have it and you can figure that out. Then, then you wanna find the shadow's um, um, length, distance. And that's pretty easy to do because you just compare its length with that of a nearby crater, the diameter of a nearby crater, which you already know the distance of. You can look that up pretty easily. So let's let's, just briefly go, go through this. I'm not gonna go through everything here, but I think you'll get the idea of it. You have uh, Theophilus, which is this crater here. Nice looking crater. In fact, you can see there's a, a central peak in the center of it. And you can see the shadow of, of its uh, Eastern wall and the diameter of the crater. And you can uh, measure how far it is to the terminator, the most difficult, uh, the largest degree of in inaccuracy in, in this uh, procedure is figuring out where the terminator, terminator line really is. You got to guess. I could be, uh, you know, I could have moved, moved this over left to right just a little bit, just, just by guessing in a different way. But this is what I chose. So uh, the coordinates of uh, uh, Theophilus is, uh, it, I can't remember what I have, 11.4 uh, degrees. Actually, I have north here, but it's really south. It makes no, so no difference in the formula. And you can figure out th that the uh, surface longitude distance is 29.7 kilometers per degree. Great. That's going to help you in just a moment. Knowing that Theophilus is, is 100 mil, uh, millimeters, 100 kilometers wide, you can figure out easily that its distance from the terminator is about one, two and a half times that distance, uh, three times the distance, so 324 kilometers from the Eastern wall all the way over to the Terminator. And you can keep proceeding like this, judging, figuring out the proportional distances by just knowing the diameter of Theophilus. 
by doing all this, you can come up with, with doing all, all the formulas, which all, by the way, which is just explained very well in this, in this book that everybody's got to have. Uh, doing that repeatedly, you'll be able to find that the, the depth of the crater floor, that is this depth right here, is about 3.1 kilometers by what I just did. The published value is 3.2 kilometers. Now, I think this is pretty good considering that here I am, this is my photograph taken on my iPhone through my eight inch telescope. I'm 240,000 miles away. And yet I can tell, I can measure the distance, or excuse me, the elevations of certain lunar features. This wall, I came up with 3.1 but actually it's 3.2 kilometers. I think that's pretty good for, you know, this is a pretty crummy picture that I took, but you can still get, get some interesting information off of it. I uh, repeat all this stuff, what I just said, and you can figure the central peak, the height of the central peak. Uh, I came up with uh, 2.97, too many significant digits there I know, okay, 2.0 kilometers. And the published height is, is two kilometers. Pretty, pretty, darn, pretty darn good. Uh, this is a two-part screen. This is the bottom part. So when I drew everything out proportionally, you can see how the office really looks. It has a, a crater up on, on the left, or excuse me, right-hand side, dips down pretty flat floor. And you got the region in the center of the central peak, flat floor again, then back up the other side. So you can see that the central peak isn't quite as high, doesn't reach quite as, as high as, as the walls. This is true of all the craters. So this is pretty good. And you can see that the lunar orbiter picture below, just to compare it, go, yeah, 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 I see what you're talking about. And again, I think what is really amazing, here I am with my crummy little iPhone and my eight inch telescope from 240,000 miles away, confirming what NASA spent, you know, uh, $3.9 billion to figure out right there. And it, well, it took me 500 bucks to figure it out. So. No, I'm kidding, of course, but that, that, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. That is what I like about astronomy, doing stuff on your own, kind of confirming all this stuff. Um, yeah, confirming it so you know it's true, what people have said and found out. Yeah, it all makes, make, makes a lot of sense. So the whole idea, especially in this, in this September, first part of October, when the moon is ideally situated, go out, go outside, explore the moon. I know you've all seen it but go back and look a little bit closer to see what all this stuff really is. Explore the moon and try to understand what, what you see. And that really all comes out that you're able to see more and uh, get more out of the hobby, appreciate your time under the stars. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. There you got it. Thank you, John. That, that is pretty cool. When you figure you just used an iPhone to take your picture, I mean, well, and that, that's something that you got to do, really. People say, well, I don't, you know, I'll just draw it. Yeah. Now, you know, yeah. the way you draw things, you're going to be off a little bit. So you should have a picture. But you know, it's just an iPhone holding it up to the eyepiece. There, there was no fancy mechanism here. I'm just holding it up to the eyepiece. You know, click a few pictures, toss out some, and use the best. And there you go. Yeah, that is pretty amazing. Uh, now, I would have never thought you could have gotten that close. Um. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, who, who would have thought, you know, 15, 20 years ago that you could use a telephone to take astronomical <laughs> images and do science with it? Yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, th I think it's, it's pretty amazing. And, you know, you're at a star party uh, and there's a line of people. They all want to see, see the moon or that. Well, you know, show them. You, you got everybody has their camera, you know, hold the camera up, get a picture of the, of the lunar surface and then they'll see them texting it off to their buddies you know like, look what i just saw blah, blah. anyway it's, it's a lot of fun so thank you yeah. thank you for having me on for uh, sharing my enthusiasm <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for being here john we can always count on you for your enthusiasm and we definitely do appreciate it you bring a lot of really interesting projects to us so thank oh, you well. again and some of us even true so that's pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that one <laughs> Oh, all right. Um, next up will be Molly Wazer. Oh, Molly is the Deputy Director of International Observe the Moon Night. She is the Digital Media Lead at NASA Goddard's Solar System Exploration Division in Maryland. 
where she works on Lucy, Osiris Rex, Lunar Re Reconnaissance, Orbiter, and Da Vinci missions. She leads content development for moon.nasa.gov at NASA Moon social media accounts and co-leads at NASA solar system social media accounts. Her favorite moon fact is that the moon has one of the coldest measured places in our solar system. Hmm. And that is Hermite Trader at North Pole is, oh man, negative 410 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a negative 250 degrees Celsius. Oh, oh my gosh, that's cold. It's very cold. Yeah, yeah. The, um, I'm. you're probably aware the moon has at the poles, um, craters that just haven't seen sunlight for billions of years because of the moon's orientation relative to the sun. So it's really, really cold in there. <laughs> well, welcome, Molly. We're glad to have you here. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate um, the Astronomical League inviting me here today um, and especially John, thank you so much for uh, giving that talk. I learned, I did not realize you could do that. Um, so I learned something new about the moon um, and also for convincing everyone here why the fall is a wonderful time to observe the moon. Uh, so you did part of my job for me. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to also pull up a presentation. Let's see. Um, so, uh, let's see, I think, can you all see my slides? Yes. Um, so Terry, thank you for the introduction. I also um, just want to acknowledge the other members of the International Observe the Moon Night Coordinating Committee. You may recognize some names on there. I know um, many of these folks are very involved in the observing community um, and have worked with the Astronomical League in the past. So um, I actually want to start off and I have a second computer over here so I can see the chat. But just um, if people could just type into the chat, has anyone participated in International Observe the Moon Night before? And I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'll wait a little. Scott Roberts has, I know, he he um, led our global moon party <laughs> last year, which was a fantastic program. Very appreciate that. Um, so it looks like some people have, some people haven't. So um, I that's great either way. Um, so uh, International Observes the Moon, I hope I can convince you to participate this year um, if John hasn't already convinced you to look at the moon on October 1st. So um, first I wanted to share this graphic, which is also the graphic behind me. And um, I think, I'll, again, I'll ask you and I'll we'll deal with that little awkward <laughs> uh, silence uh, as we wait for the chat to load. Um, but I was wondering what this image evokes to you about International Observe the Moon Night. What are some things that you think of just by looking at this image that tell you about the program? If any of the fellow panelists would like to jump in as well, go ahead. Maybe state the question again, Molly. Oh, okay. So the question is, um, by looking at this graphic, what does that make you think of? Um, what are some of the kind of the feelings that you get about International Observe the Moon Night? 
Uh, does it make you think of anything? It makes me. Uh, I, I, I think it, it means, at least to me, this is John Goss speaking. It means to me that it's for anybody, any place, uh, looking at looking at the moon uh, or even the even the stars. I mean, you have a, a a young. I guess it's a young boy with a pair of binoculars. He can see the moon. You have the Eiffel Tower. Or, uh, anyway, all these structures that are recognizable from around the world. So this is a, something that you can do any place. And maybe some animals can recognize the moon too. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of tells me to get out yeah. and, and enjoy nature. You know, go outside, get some fresh air, look around, look at what's around you, and just kind of kick back, relax, and enjoy. This kind of thing also unites people around the world and dissolves their differences. You know, so uh, in a in the troubled world that we have today, you know, that's such an important message. Okay, well, thank you. That's it. <laughs> no, but um, you all uh, definitely, um, I'm very pleased to hear that this graphic evoked uh, those, those thoughts for you, because those are the major goals of our program. So, um, as John said, this International Observe the Moon Night is for everyone, everywhere. The moon, as we know, is the brightest object in our night sky. Um, the it's accessible to um, people who live in really light polluted areas. You know, so much of sky watching, you have to be in a dark sky environment, but with the moon, you can see it from Times Square. Um, and uh, it's also, you know, uh, the young children look at the moon, they start to notice that it changes. They start to observe, noticing the world around them, looking up, um, so it kind of leads you on a path of scientific inquiry, um, we hope, and that's what we, um, one of our goals of International Observe the Moon Night is to use the moon as a stepping stone to learn about uh, the astronomy, other planetary science, other space science, science in general. Um, so uh, you all said that very well. Um, and then as Scott mentioned, it's, you know, a global event. Um, so uh, we all have, our one planet has one moon, <laughs> one satellite. So uh, we have the opportunity to look at it together on International Observe the Moon Night. And then as Terry mentioned, um, you know, getting out in nature, um, exploring, getting to experience that is, is definitely an important part of the program as well. So uh, what is International Observe the Moon Night? It's um, one day each year um, in September or October where um, we encourage people around the world to observe the moon together. So the program started with events being event-based. Um, so you can see here pictures from events from all around the world, people getting together, uh, uh, looking at the moon together, you know, just setting up telescopes, looking up. Um, we have some, obviously with the pandemic, we've started having virtual events. We've also encouraged people to observe with friends and family at home and even just to observe on their own. So we've really expanded what International Observe the Moon Night is during the pandemic so that people can observe the moon safely. Oops. So this is a photograph of the moon from one of our International Observe the Moon Night participants. And, um, a lot of audiences, not this audience, because I think you know <laughs> why, but a lot of audiences ask why we don't have International Observe the Moon Night on a full moon. And obviously a first quarter moon um, makes for really beautiful lunar observing. John pointed that out earlier, but that line along the Terminator, you can see the really stunning views of the lunar craters, lunar landforms, um, and of course, it's not as bright, so you can uh, get, you know, it's a little bit easier to look at those features. 
And then um, a first quarter moon is high in the sky in the evening, which is much nicer for observing than many other things that you have to stay up all night for. So we interpret um, observe really broadly for International Observe the Moon Night. Um, and this, again, is a way to make it accessible to all um, types of people. So we all know clouds, pesky clouds, <laughs> really can get in the way of observing the sky. Um, but we still celebrate International Observe the Moon Night. Um, just you can listen to some moon music. You can watch a moon theme movie. You can explore data of the moon. Um, we offer, um, we have 3D prints. Um, so you can, for those who can't actually see, they can feel the moon. They can feel what lunar craters feel like. Um, you can do art projects, activities all about the moon. So we are really invested in um, expanding the way that you can observe. So um, if you visit our website, moon.nasa.gov slash observe, um, you'll get access to all types of resources. Um, you can find an event to attend if you'd like to an attend an event. Um, if you'd like to host an event, we have a lot of resources for you, um, including um, materials to publicize your event. And it also, um, you know, photography guides, all sorts of things. And we also offer the opportunity to register. So by registering your event on our website, um, if you're hosting an event for the public, um, either in person or virtual, you can, um, it's, enough, you know, it advertises the event, it goes on our website so the um, people can find it. You can also register just your participation as a private um, private event or individual observer. And by registering, you actually will gain access to um, a lunar reconnaissance orbiter image that has not been published yet. So um, early access, if that's enticing to you. Um, it is in our downloaded data archive if you know how to access the LRO archives, but most people don't. <laughs> so. Um, that's an, uh, a fun opportunity. So last year, um, and here's an example of our event map. So I can't tell you the amount of time that I've spent playing with this map, looking at the little dots, seeing where people are observing from. It's astounding to me I, that this um, event, this is now our 13th year, um, that was just started uh, by some folks working on the LRO and uh, mission of, you know, 13 years ago, um, thought, hey, let's let's get people together to observe the moon. And now it's um, in, I think, 147 countries, all seven continents. We had an event at the South Pole the past two years, which is amazing. Um, and they're continuing to observe the moon from down there. Um, and uh, so we had close to 4,000 registrants, either hosts, event hosts, or just observers. And um, it, this is, yeah, I'm, I find this very powerful um, just to see that people all over the world are interested in lunar observing. Um, for this group, I also wanted to let you know that, um, and this relates to uh, what John was talking about as well, um, but we have moon maps. So this is specifically for October 1st. These maps are created by Brian Day, um, who works at NASA Ames and is an avid observer. Um, so he uh, creates these maps um, and offers a variety of locations for you to observe both with the naked eye and uh, the little pink triangles we call telescopic treats. Um, so those are some exciting things to look at. Um, 
John pointed out the law of Theophilus, Cyrillus, and Caprina craters. Um, those will be visible on October 1st. Um, so uh, those these moon maps are available on the website. Um, and then I also wanted to let you know, we do have an International Observe the Moon Night Astronomical League Observing Challenge. So um, we worked with Aaron Clevenson to set this up. And um, so you can, um, if you, uh, I think he has a, a few more challenging <laughs> sites that you can look for on the moon. And then um, you'll get an official International Observe the Moon Night certificate in addition to um, the, some of the Astronomical League um, accolades that you'd get anyway. So I definitely wanted to let this group know about that. Um, another th way to observe, we are having an official broadcast on NASA TV on October 1st at 7 p.m. Um, so obviously this may, if the, I would encourage you to watch it if it's cloudy where you are, otherwise go outside. Um, but this uh, broadcast uh, will showcase some of the latest in lunar science and exploration. There's so much happening at NASA in lunar exploration right now. So we have talks from scientists. Um, we have some videos all about the Artemis program. Um, and then uh, videos from people around the world and how they celebrate. And of course, you heard at the beginning that I do social media. Social media is a great way to connect. Um, our hashtag is observe the moon. Um, and uh, uh, you can find information about International Observe the Moon Night on NASA Moon on Twitter and then Facebook, the page is International Observe the Moon Night. Um, but people share all sorts of things about how they're celebrating International Observe the Moon Night on social media. You can share your images, um, what you're up to that night. And we also have a Flickr gallery, which is where a lot of these images that I've shown in this presentation come from. Um, so this is uh, where people can upload their pictures from their events. And this is, um, yeah, again, it's just really powerful to see how people in Mozambique are observing the moon. Um, people in Calcutta are observing the moon. Um, I remember uh, a few years ago, uh, I saw an event in Syria right when there was all this bombing in Syria. And I was like, wow, these people still got together to look at the moon. It was very moving. So, um, and I know, I'm sure there's some uh, astrophotographers in this group. So it's a place where you can upload your photos as well. Um, we please like me, if you do upload your photos, um, add your name um, so that people know where you are and who took the photo. And we actually use some of these photos on uh, the NASA website. So if that's interesting, appealing to you, um, make sure to visit the Flickr gallery. And then um, an appeal to this group, we, uh, as a, you know, clouds. Um, so we do live stream the moon. So we have a few live streams that we're sharing on our website. Um, if you are planning to live stream the moon that evening, if that's something that you enjoy doing, um, you can fill out this form. I can put the link in the chat <laughs> um, in a little bit uh, just to let us know that you're interested in live streaming the moon. Um, and then NASA is also looking for live streams of the November 8th total lunar eclipse. So if that happens to be in your plans, um, just let us know and I put my email down here uh, so you can uh, let me know. So after International Observing the Moon Night, it's very important that um, we celebrate uh, this, this accomplishment. So we have certificates, you can print your own certificate. There's a special Astronomical League version of the certificate um, if you complete the observing challenge. and then. Um, we 
Uh, also, evaluation is very important part of our program. So I have a QR code here on the bottom left um, for surveys. We take sur um, our uh, survey data very seriously. We're constantly working to make sure that we are providing resources um, that you would like as a participant of International Observers of Moon Night. So um, I, if you do plan to participate, I urge you to also complete the survey. And then bonus, you'll get another exclusive image from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, early access if um, that is enticing to you again. Um, so this year's International Observer of the Moon Night is October 1st. The date does change every year. Um, we have the future dates on our website, but obviously we don't uh, use a lunar calendar, um, but it's always in kind of late September, early October. And uh, that's it for me. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, Molly. That's really interesting to see how the other countries, you know, to see how many people were out and observing. I, it's amazing really how much astronomy too, I think in the last couple of years since COVID, we've seen a jump in yeah. membership. And I'm sure a lot of people, you know, are fairly new to astronomy, or at least that's what I've seen some, uh, that they're very interested and don't really know how to go about you know, to learn more about astronomy. And I think starting with the moon is probably one of the best ways to do it because it's something people relate to. They all have seen it with their own eyes. Now, if they can look through a telescope or however, I think then it enhances the whole experience. Yeah, I agree. This summer I was out in um, <clears throat> rural California and there was this 11 year old boy that uh, had just gotten a telescope, but it, we were having trouble. He was like, oh, you know how to use a telescope? Can you help me? And it turned out it was actually built for lunar observing. And so he wanted me to help him set up the, the, the telescope for the moon, but it was very close to a new moon. And I was like, I'm so mm. sorry, the moon isn't really <laughs> up right now. And mm. he said, oh, and he got so mad, he stood up and he walked out and he said, I've never made someone so angry by telling them the moon phase before. <laughs> I, you know, it was, he was very excited <laughs> to look up at the moon with his telescope. And so that's, that's our goal is really to, to use the moon to, uh, to, to eventually get people to where um, you all are in terms of observing. You know, at a, I was on outreach and we had a refractor set up and it was so amazing. The, there was a tiny little girl and I don't know how little she was, but she, she maybe four years old, little blonde girl. And her dad was a big man and she wanted to look through the refractor and, you know, she couldn't see. So her dad lifts her up to look at the moon and she gets her eye up there and she goes, oh, daddy, potholes. <laughs> and I mean, the whole place came unglued. She related that to potholes, the craters to potholes. But to hear that little girl say that, oh my gosh, we were rolling. It was, it's amazing what people see and how they inter interpret. Or, or, you know, little kids or even big, I mean, people that have never seen this before, how they really interpret what they're seeing and seeing with their own eyes. Yeah, that's such a great story. I, yeah. Um, I mean, she was relating. They are kind of potholes in a way. They are, they're they're yeah, holes. <laughs> to a kid, yeah. I mean, yeah. it was she. Was, it was just such an ex surprised expression, just the way she said it, and she was just so amazed. She kind of grabbed the eyepiece, and we're all going, "No, no, no!" You know, you can't. But it was adorable, you know. And it was her first time she had ever seen through a telescope and seen the moon. It was the first time her father had ever seen the moon through the telescope. So, you know, it was a pretty big deal. You know, it, it kind of gets people excited because they can see something that they have seen with their eyes. They, they could actually now maybe look down into a crater or maybe see something like the Lunar X, you know, something out there that they didn't really know about. So it really, I think it fires people up. So, all right, Molly, thank you so much for coming. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. Uh, Scott, you had put in the questions that someone asked about the new website. 
And I think, Car oh, there's Carol. Do you want to answer it or do you want me to answer it? <laughs> yes, you're muted. Heard that term before. You're muted. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as any of you who have worked on a brand new website knows, sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you in your wildest dream imagined. And that's kind of where we are with the Astronomical League. We're 90% done with the process. And now we're going through very carefully and making sure the data is as current as we can get it and that it's, uh, 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 we call all that. So I hate to say an absolute date, but we are on the ending part of that. And uh, I hope you'll hang with us just a little while longer. It is coming. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Carol. I tell you what, Scott, let's take about a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back to okay. Brett. Is that okay with you, Brett? Yes, that's fine. Okay. We'll be back then in about 10 minutes with Brent Maynard. Okay. So here we go.
Everybody. I hope you enjoyed that little uh, break there um, and uh, you know the uh, that visualization from NASA and Hubble so um, I'll turn this back over to Terry Mann but you're watching the 20th uh, Astronomical League live program so with uh, Terry Mann thank you so much thank you so much Scott Maynard before we start with you I forgot to ask the questions for the door prize so I'm gonna ask some questions real quick after I share the screen the right way. There we go. So this week's door prize will be an Astronomical League 75th anniversary pin and an Astronomical League sticker. Uh, oh, it's a magnet, three inch round magnet. So three people will win this. Uh, I did wanna announce one more time we are having trouble with international shipping, so we're temporarily stopping international shipping because when we use this as a door prize, the tote bag's value was $12. But when we had to ship it out of the country, it, it went up because of taxes, duties, custom fees, everything. It went up to between $60 to $70 before the person finally received it. And either they had to pay it or we had to pay it, which seemed ridiculous for a $12 tote bag. So for right now, until we figure out some kind of solution to this, we will not be shipping internationally anymore. So 
as much as we'd love to have you, you can answer the questions, but if you win a door prize, it will not be shipped at this point, but we are working on it. So send your answers in the next 30 minutes because I will announce winners right after Brent's talk and someone from the Astronomical League will contact the winners. And you will send your answers to these questions to secretary at astroleague.org. So here's the questions for tonight. Tonight we have heard about the International Observe the Moon Night. Now this is a true or false question. Is one of the activities everyone can do sketching the moon together? True or false? One of the activities that everybody can do is sketch the moon together. True or false? Answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Brent Maynard's topic for tonight is preparing for a night of image capture. There's a beautiful galaxy in Triangulum that's at its best in the fall. What galaxy is it? So tell me what galaxy in Triangulum that is at the best in the fall. Tell me what galaxy it is. And Brent's going to get us ready for going out and imaging or viewing the fall night sky. Now, this answer already came up, so we'll see if you were listening. What is the date of the total lunar eclipse in November? It's been a long time since I've seen a total lunar eclipse. It's always been clouded out. So hopefully, we'll get to see this one. So what is the date for the total lunar eclipse in November? And that is the questions for right now. And please send your answers in right away because I will give the answers right after um, Brent's talk. So thank you. And from this, we are going to go to Brent Maynard. Now, Brent Maynard was a senior IT director at Marshall. He retired in January of 2022, and he's still teaching in computer science department as an adjunct faculty member. Brent began his astronomy and astrophotography hobby when he purchased his first telescope, a C8 in 1989. Imaging planetary and deep sky objects is his favorite pastime. And he enjoys dabbling with the astronomical gear set up over the years. He tries to keep his imaging gear simple and at a reasonable cost. He likes to tinker with technology and has modified multiple cameras to make them more sensitive to the H-alpha emission line. Brent lives in the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tees Valley, hey. thank you, of West Virginia and likes to get to the mountains of West Virginia where there are some of the darkest skies east of the Mississippi. And actually, I think you are there now in some of the darkest skies, aren't you? Yes, I'm in Blackwater Falls State Park. Yeah, that, I think we all wish we were there with you. So Brent, if you would, take it away. Okay, what I'm going to start by doing is uh, showing them my video. I'm a little bit bandwidth constrained, so I don't want that to compete with the presentation. And I'll sure. pop it back up in just a few minutes. So I'm going to uh, start uh, sharing my screen and jump into a PowerPoint presentation. I'll kind of bounce out uh, to some images and stuff. And if uh, I'll, I want to thank Terry for inviting me to the, uh, to the presentation this evening. And if you have any questions, I don't have the ability to see the questions, but uh, if somebody on the uh, Zoom call wants to uh, relay those to me, I'd be more than uh, happy to uh, try to answer those. So let's um, share my screen. Okay, let me know if that's coming up okay. Yes, it is. I had to go through the Mac setup of allowing Zoom to share, share my screen. Yeah. And can you see the first slide? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So uh, my name is Brent Maynard. Uh, thanks again to Terry and the 
Astronomical League for inviting me to tonight's call. Uh, feel free to uh, email me at uh, brent.maynard at marshall.edu. I recently retired from Marshall University, but I'm still doing adjunct uh, teaching. So I still have my active uh, email address, which is my primary uh, way of uh, communicating with people across email. So what I want to do first is uh, just talk about some of the images I take and then how I prepare for a, a night's uh, imaging. So I want to jump out just real quick to a uh, gallery. And then um, I added just, just recently, just a few minutes ago, when we started talking about the International Observer of the Moon Night, I took this image a few years ago from my driveway uh, down in Taze Valley, uh, West Virginia. It's on the western part of the state. And it was a really good night. Um, and so I pulled my gear out and uh, this was with the C8 and a um, just a Canon DSLR camera. Uh, just it was a really good night for uh, imaging the moon. But typically, probably about 80% of the time, I'm going after uh, typically wide field deep sky objects. Um, and about the 20% uh, of my time, I'll pull out my C8 and do planetary imaging or galaxy imaging. But I really like uh, doing uh, wide field uh, deep sky uh, imaging just because of the the, the vast array of uh, objects and colors and dust and nebula and all kinds of great stuff that you can that you can capture. So I'm just going to go quickly through some of the images. These are all within the past uh, 12 to 18 months, all taken here in West Virginia at, at a variety of dark sky locations, uh, all different focal lengths, uh, different types of lenses. I typically use uh, lenses for my imaging except for you know, going for planetary or galaxy uh, when I pull out the, the C8. This is my most recent Jupiter from about a month ago. Um, we had a really good night, which is rare around here with a nice steady scene. Uh, so that was a, a rare opportunity to capture Jupiter and I was able to get that from the, we had a clear night. Wow. Uh, just some more wide field. Uh, this is with a 85 millimeter telephoto lens. Uh, this is with the C8 uh, globular cluster. This is uh, M8 again, but instead of a 85 millimeter, this is at 1200 millimeter uh, through the C8 with a focal reducer. The Lagoon Nebula, uh, M16, the Eagle Nebula, also with the C8 with the focal reducer. Uh, M51. Uh, this was over about three nights. I imaged uh, three nights in a row. I uh, had a string of good uh, good nights, and I captured about six hours total worth of data uh, to get this particular image. And this was all from my um, my driveway uh, in, a, in some light pollution. So I was using some filters to help mitigate light pollution, which I'm going to talk about here in just a minute. Uh, M81, M82. Uh, M101, and here's some more wide field using telephoto lenses, the North American and Pelican Nebula, uh, some more galaxies. I'm going to go through these real quick. Um, there's just a couple more. This is one that I wanted to talk about a little bit just because uh, of the detail available in this image can only be captured at a really dark sky location. And this was captured at Spruce Knob. Uh, back in July of 2020, uh, during the pandemic, it was a we had a great evening up there, and this is just a total of two hours worth of data, one one hour for each panel, and uh, getting to a dark sky location uh, with nice clear skies is it makes the whole imaging process that much easier because you're getting a good data set uh, as uh, to to work with. So let's just jump out of this, get back into the presentation. And speaking of um, finding a dark sky location. So one of the first things you want to try to do is get to a dark sky location. And this is the light pollution map of the United States. And as you can see, east of the Mississippi is pretty challenging to find a good dark sky location. Out west, they're, you know, they're kind of all over the place. But here on the east where we are, 
it's a bit of a challenge. I uh, am currently, as I mentioned, I'm in Blackwater Falls State Park. It's uh, right there in the middle of the Monongahela National Forest in the mountains of West Virginia. And if you zoom in, if you have a light pollution map viewer, you can look around the East Coast and there's just a few handful of places where you actually have some nice stark skies. And as you can see, the stark areas where Spruce Knob is located, Canaan Valley, uh, Blackwater Falls, where I, I'm currently located. And these are Bortle 2 skies. And at Spruce Knob, it's just right on the edge of Bortle 1, a very, very dark location. Um, in the summertime with the Milky Way up, you can walk around, talk, see people. You can almost read things off the paper just from the, the, the glow of the Milky Way. The, the Milky Way is so bright that it, it light, lights up the whole area. So that's, that's pretty, um, pretty fantastic to get under a dark sky location. Over to the right, you can actually see uh, Washington, D.C., the Washington, D.C. Metro. That's about three hours, three and a half hours away from this dark sky location. So it's um, the state of West Virginia, some of the state parks and some of the county park systems are starting to leverage the dark sky uh, attribute, uh, and, and they're starting to promote that. So we've had a couple of state parks uh, get named to the dark sky uh, locations, uh, recognize as dark sky, mitigating light pollution. And so it seems to be a growing um, effort in, in this part of the state to preserve the dark skies, which I hope that we can keep this little black hole here forever. So let's get to the core of the topic, which, you know, how do we, how do I get set up for a, for a night of imaging? And I just want to talk about my gear, what I what I currently use. Uh, I, I'm, you know, all my gear is pretty moderate. Uh, you know, I, I don't have really a lot of high end stuff. I do have a couple of nice lenses, but most of my gear has either been purchased off eBay or used, or I've modified it myself. So I try to keep things because uh, I like to tinker. That's one of my other hobbies, other than astrophotography, is just kind of tinkering around with things. But I have a um, Orion series mount, which is the equivalent to the HEQ5 series of, of mounts. I self-modified a Canon RP camera. That's my primary imaging camera right now. And I have a collection of lenses, all kinds of lenses. And my go-to lens is the Nikkor 180 millimeter um, prime manual focus lens from the early 90s. It's a great lens. It's F2.8. And also, I uh, recently acquired some Sigma lenses for fantastic wide field. That one image I showed you, the two panels of the Fuchius region into the core of the Milky Way, that was done with that 85 millimeter Sigma lens. And of course, Terry mentioned in the, in the bio about my first telescope with the C8, uh, which I purchased back in 1989. I still use it. It's a great, uh, it's a great piece of equipment and still produces good images. Um, the other thing that I have, which is you know, some important things, you know, battery tanks, battery packs. Uh, technology now is great with the lithium iron phosphate technology. Uh, they're not very heavy. They last forever. So having those in the field, uh, instead of lugging around, you know, lead acid or gel cell batteries like we used to have to do uh, to keep uh, power on things is, is, a, is a good thing. Technology keeps on advancing, helping us uh, with our image capturing uh, capability. And one of those advances in technology, and I've been a heavy user recently in the past few years of the ASI Air uh, from ZWO, which helps with uh, controlling the mount, doing uh, image capture, image planning, polar alignment, plate solving. It's a nice little uh, Raspberry Pi uh, based device. So this is my typical gear that I would take out to a dark sky location. Right now, this is all sitting in the back of my car because I just got up here this afternoon. And so I, I, after this talk, I'm actually going to go outside and start setting up. Uh, some additional uh, gear, and some of these are a little bit uh, tongue in cheek, but they, they happen. Um, Make sure you have a good, good sturdy tripod. Even if you just want to do time lapse, uh, you know, not guiding or anything, uh, something that can hold your your gear, your, your camera, your lenses, and um, 
The other thing, don't forget your weight. I don't know how many times, a handful of times, I forgot I forgot to pack my weights with me or brought them with me. So what do you do? Well, I just go get some water bottles and tape them to my mouth to try to balance my mouth. I've done that before. Of course, bring things like duct tape, masking, or gaffer tape to help assist when you need that. Uh, things like taping water bottles to your to your uh, mouth, keep your gear in balance. Uh, don't forget the batteries and chargers, uh, memory cards. Uh, make sure your memory cards are not uh, too full. Um, when I was at Blackwater Falls, I mean, when I was at um, Green Bank, we had a star party uh, this summer at Green Bank. Terry was at, and John was at. The, um, I was doing some imaging and I forgot to check the status of my memory cards and I filled up a card and I probably lost about two hours worth of images because the card was full and I just wasn't paying attention. I was too busy talking. Um, cables, power, hand warmers. I don't use um, power uh, do uh, mitigation. I use hand warmers. I just uh, uh, tape or rubber band hand warmers to my lenses or my C8 to keep the dew away. And use dew shields. I try to keep the power requirements at a minimum, especially when I'm out in a remote place and it's harder to recharge uh, your battery packs. And of course, always bring a toolbox with just a bunch of stuff in it because you never know. Uh, one of my fellow um, astrophotographers, uh, photographers, we went down to the Winter Star Party and he forgot some of the key bolts that were, he required to attach his uh, mount to his tripod. And we just happened to have some C-clamps. So we were able to use C-clamps to uh, fasten his gear together because he forgot the, the bolt. So it's always good to just bring some stuff with you in, in the event that you need something. Because some of the dark sky locations that I go to here in the state, there's nothing around for a couple of hours. And you have to drive two or three hours to get to like a Walmart or a significantly sized box store to where you might be able to find things you need. Now, getting ready to set up, you know, uh, it's during the daytime. You know, find your way, which, which way is north. You can use a, a compass on your phone. You can use a you know, regular compass you might have on your mount. And just kind of generally get it uh, pointing north. So you're, you know, you're ready when it gets dark to, to kind of fine tune that. Uh, also, for astrophotography, you, you want to make sure that your uh, mount is balanced, that, you're, that your optical train is not too heavy on one side and putting too much stress and strain on the gears or the belt or even just the mount um, structure that it's not causing any issues. Uh, but you don't want to have perfect balance. You want to actually have a, a little bit of out, of out out of balance to one side or the other so that it's not um, it's too, too good and you have a little bit of gear slop. It'll sit there and cog back and forth between the gears and cause your stars to not be uh, nice little round dots and you might get some elongated stars if uh, if you actually have your mount balanced too well. Uh, do polar alignment if you have a polar scope. Um, and I use an app on my uh, smartphone called PS Align. It tells me uh, what the current hour angle is. You know, where does where do I need to put Polaris in the polar scope? That's a nice little app if, um, if you don't have that. And uh, so you can do kind of a rough polar alignment or to get as close as you as you need to. The better you can do polar alignment, the better your image data is going to be down the road, especially if you're wanting to take um, long exposures. You're getting up into the four, five, even 10 minute exposures. You need to have pretty good polar alignment. Uh, keep an eye on your cable. Don't make, you know, you don't want cable binding, you know, getting you know, dragging around, getting stuck on a, on something on your mouth, but that'll cause issues as well with tracking. Um, and after you get your polar alignment, if you're using a go-to mount with a hand controller, go through the star alignment process. That just helps the mount uh, understand where it is, and, and it'll, it'll help it with its go-to um, when you're going looking for your uh, target. I've already mentioned the dew prevention. I use hand warmers. They work great over the years. And then the primary reason is I just don't want to have to worry about um, 
more power out in the field. Try to keep that as, 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 as at a minimum. Through the night, as the temperature changes uh, and you're taking your images, your focus will change. You know, things cool down, your uh, focus will adjust. Your optical frame changes. You know, physically, uh, have you know, changes in size and stuff as it gets cooler. So focus, image a while, check your focus, refocus, and then you can image some more uh, to make sure that um, you keep your uh, images nice and sharp. Uh, if you don't, I've, I've had this happen to me where I just forgot or just didn't do it. And the, the first part of the images are really nice, but towards the end, you can see where things started getting out of focus and the data was not as good. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, make sure you have plenty of space on your uh, memory cards. Uh, with these high uh, megapixel cameras these days, the images, uh, you know, typically 30, 40, even 50 megabytes per image. And if you're going to be taking, you know, maybe 150 or 200 or even more images during the night, or you're doing time lapse where you might be taking upwards of a thousand images to do a a long time lapse of the Milky Way transiting, then you gotta be careful of not running out of space. Also, double check and make sure that you are shooting your image data in raw mode. Do not use JPEG. JPEG uh, is a compressed uh, image format and you're losing data. You do not want the camera uh, doing that compression for you. Uh, and because you're you're actually it's throwing away good image data, so always make sure you have ROM uh, enabled if you're using a DSLR. Another one I've done this multiple times. Um, you're taking uh, sample shots, you know, 15 second shot or a 30 second shot, but you're ultimately wanting to take a two minute exposure. Don't forget to put your camera in bulb mode. Um, after you've done some test shots. I've done this before where I'll have it set at 30 seconds on my camera, and then I will start my intervalometer or you know whatever I'm using to control the image I capture, and I'll set it to two minutes, and I come back and I have a 30 second exposure with a minute and 60 seconds where nothing happens until the next exposure, and then I get another 30 second exposure. So just make sure if you're going to be doing long exposure, you know, minute to minute or longer, make sure you put up your camera back in the bulb mode if you are doing any type of test images at a shorter um, exposure time. Use some type of intervalometer uh, just to help with the process. I'm using the ASI Air now from ZWO, which controls my camera, and so it, it'll do all the exposure settings and you know, however I want to set those up. Or you can just use a regular uh, handheld intervalometer for your camera type. You know, plug it in and set that up, and um, just you know, you know just make sure that everything's uh, ready to go. I've already mentioned uh, the thing about uh, refocusing over time to make sure you're still getting nice sharp images. Uh, routinely check your battery. Make sure, especially when it's cold. Uh, you know, where I live, and I do a lot of imaging in the winter time. And it will get down into the teens uh, regularly throughout the winter time, and the batteries uh, do not last nearly as long when they start getting cold. So uh, you might need to change your batteries often during the winter time uh, just because of the power draw. You can also uh, get camera battery uh, adapter packs, which you can plug into like your power bank. You know, if you have a uh, Celestron or need or whatever power tank uh, that you can plug into. You can get these uh, battery packs that plug into your camera. And so you can have power all night long. So that's another, that's another alternative. And uh, also, if you're going to be doing guiding, uh, just make sure that your uh, guide scope is generally pointing in the same direction that your imaging uh, uh, optical train is pointing. You know, it can be off just a little bit, but you don't want to be too far off because you'll get some, you might get some uh, round, odd shaped stars uh, because of the, the way that the uh, optics aren't pointing at the same part of the sky. So, 
So um, some other uh, key things to, uh, to do as you're imaging through the night, and even if you're using uh, do mitigation, even if you're using do zappers or do strips um, or hand warmers, if you get into like we have around this part of the, the country in the, in the eastern part of the United States during the summertime, we can have uh, heavy dew and it can overwhelm your dew system. So you also want to make sure that your lenses or your um, telescope objective lenses are not getting dewed over and it'll start gradually and then within a, just a few minutes you'll go from having a nice clear optics to completely being dewed over and so uh, keep an eye on on that as well especially if you're in a humid environment like in the um, on the east coast of the western or east coast of the united states especially here even in the mountains we get uh, some significant dew so just be careful with that One other uh, resource I wanted to show, I showed some um, snapshots um, of the light pollution um, maps. So this is just uh, lightpollutionmap.info. Uh, you can just Google this light pollution map and it'll get you to this link. It's a nice uh, interactive environment where you can zoom in and see the uh, different locations. And I'm zooming into where we are currently located here in the mountains of West Virginia. And you can kind of go around and click on a location and you get this little uh, bubble pop up. It tells you what the um, sky brightness is for this location. And you can see this is where I clicked is a, is a class two uh, portal uh, type. So what does that mean? You see portal number, portal one through seven. Um, you can uh, click on that, that little link there. And what you would get is this, um, scale that describes what each bordal number means. Bordal one is, is the best. Uh, we, we don't have any bordal one sites in the state of West Virginia, but we're very close. You can see the magnitude here, which is 21.99 to 22.00. Zero is the uh, criteria for bordal one. Spruce knob is like 21.95. So it's really, really close to being bordal one. And then uh, Portal 2, which is where we are, or it's where I am right now, is you know, an average dark sky. And it talks about what you can see um, in these types of environments. Um, you know, can you see N33? Uh, N31, of course, is visible here. The, the Milky Way casts shadows. You can see the zodiacal light in a Bortle one type sky. Uh, air glow is apparent. You can see um, the, lots of air glow. I have some images from uh, a place fairly close by where I had a lot of uh, nice green you know, tints in some of my images from the air glow. Uh, typically, where I live, I'm in the Bortle five, Bortle six range. So I'm in the suburban bright suburban area, which is very challenging to do imaging uh, with. This is, a nice, uh, this is a nice utility, especially if you're wanting to get interested in astrophotography and you're looking for a good place to go, uh, image your, you know, do some of your imaging. Any of these, you know, really bright spots like you know, the DC area, the, the Metro Northeast all the way up, you know, through Boston, it's just, you know, it's just almost impossible, but there's some good sites also up in Pennsylvania, Cherry Springs, um, it's up in this area in Pennsylvania, and it is a, um, another good dark sky location. And then when you get down into Georgia, there's, there's a few places uh, that are not too bad. And then you get down into, you know, parts of Florida and so it's, it's, but it is a challenge here on the east. Out west, you know, it's, a, it's easy to find a good dark sky location. But this is a nice utility to, to help you at least find a uh, general direction to go to, uh, to get to a dark sky uh, location. And that's what I have as far as what, you typically would do to prepare for 
uh, a night of imaging. Uh, and this is this is my typical gear setup. And as I mentioned, it's probably 80% of my images are done with lenses, you know, Nikon or Sigma type lenses uh, with a modified DSLR. When I want to go um, small to you know small objects, you know, galaxies or planetary, that's when I pull the Celestron C8 out and uh, start using it as as my uh, optical frame. So Terry, do you see any questions that have popped up? Scott, I'll let you look, but Maynard, I have a couple questions for you. In okay. looking at your pictures you showed in the beginning, are you using any types of filters? No, when the nice thing about going to dark sky location, uh, a lot of those images were taken uh, at either Green Bank or at Spruce Knob. Okay. So I don't need to worry about filters. I do have some images that I didn't have in that gallery that I uh, have taken at home, uh, Portal 5, Portal 6 skies. And I use a duo band filter from SCT. So it's got a uh, narrow, relatively narrow band on the O3 line and a relatively narrow band on the hydrogen alpha. And it's a, it really does a good job of mitigating uh, light pollution. Okay. What about processing? I, I know at Green Bank, you, I don't remember if you were even dabbling with PixInsight. I know you were using some other programs. What would you say is the program you use most for processing? Right now I'm using AstroPixel Processor, okay. uh, which is um, similar to PixInsight. I've never jumped into the PixInsight ocean. I, I know that it's a fairly steep learning curve yeah. and um, AstroPixel Processor, it's fairly easy to use. Uh, it has lots of features and you can you know, dig down and and uh, really do some uh, additional things with it. But I just uh, started going down that that path for now. Someday I might yeah. look at Pixel Insight, but I've, I've been happy with what I get out of Pixel AstroPixel Processor. Before that, I used uh, freeware, shareware, uh, Deep Sky Stacker. Um, yeah. Yeah. The uh, the limiting factor with Deep Sky Stacker is that it is Windows only, and I'm more of a Mac user these days. An AstroPixel processor works on both platforms, as does Fix Inside. Okay. Um, and I also use Photoshop for the final tweaking and color adjustment and things like that. Okay. So when you stack your images, how do you decide if your exposure is right? when you're taking the single images and you know you're going to stack it later, how do you know if your picture is overexposed too much when you stack or underexposed so it does not show up very well? So when I, when I take my set of test images in the beginning and I start yeah. trying to uh, get to that state, and what I want to try to do is I look at the histogram of a single yeah. image. And I want that histogram to be right around 50%. Uh, for a astrophotography image, you'll have a nice sharp peak instead of a histogram that goes all the way from left to right. So it'll actually have a nice sharp peak, right? And you can move that right or left within the histogram. You know, shorten your exposure, it goes to the left. Increase your exposure, it goes to the right. And it's the balance of that along with the ISO settings. And then, uh, with the camera that I'm currently using, I'm setting the ISO at 2000. 1600, 2000 is what I typically uh, shoot the ISO settings at with my Canon. The icons will be a little bit different or other camera types will be a little bit different. But I'm, I'm trying to get that histogram right in the middle and maybe just a little bit to the right. If it's way to the right, I'm overexposing. If it's to the left, I'm underexposing. Okay. That's what I look for, is to get my histogram in the middle. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all I have. Scott, do you have anything? Well, I... Um... I just uh, wanted to mention, you know, people enjoyed uh, uh, Brent's um, astrophotography. Norm Hughes uh, really enjoyed their Rho Ophiuchus uh, uh, region and Beatrice, uh, you know, definitely a moon lover. Beatrice Hines out of Belgium is a beautiful, uh, beautiful moon image. So thank you. Thanks for sharing those. Yeah. All right. Uh, does anyone else? Oh, wait, I better finish the questions and answers. So, Grant, thank Hi. you. So, 
so much. <laughs> I hate to get up there and go outside and say, oh man, I forgot to give the answers. <laughs> Brent, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. And I'm sure everyone else did too. Your images are absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you very much. Thank sure. you everyone for having me. Well, we're glad you came tonight. So, all right, I am going to give the answers to the questions as soon as I find them again. And all right, so here are the answers. Uh, tonight we heard about the International Observe the Moon Night. Is it true or false? One of the activities everyone can do together is sketch the moon together. And yes, that is true. Andrew Corkill answered that right. Next one, Brent Maynard's topic for tonight is preparing for a night of image capture. Beautiful galaxy and triangulum is at its best in the fall. What galaxy is it? And that would be M33, the pinwheel galaxy. And that would, the answer for that came from Barbara Brown. What date is the total lunar eclipse in November? And that will be uh, Monday, November 7th through the 8th, depending on where you are at. So, um, Everybody watch out for that. And Marilyn Wright gave that answer. Hopefully we'll be able to see it. The last couple I've been clouded out here. So hopefully so. Thank you everybody for answering. And I would like to thank Brent uh, for that nice presentation and those beautiful pictures. And Molly, uh, we will catch Molly Wazer um, the next time and David Levy. We always enjoy David, and we do hope Wendy gets to feeling a lot better. Scott Roberts, the founder and CEO of Explore Scientific, and Carol Orge, the Astronomical League president. Thank you. And I do not want to forget John Goss because I didn't put him on here, apparently. We always appreciate John Goss. He brings some really exciting stuff, and he just does a great job along with everybody else. We couldn't do this without everybody that appears on this, and we sure couldn't do it without everyone watching. So we do thank everyone that, that has tuned in and always does. Our next AL Live will be on, yeah, we changed the date, um, on the 28th of October. We're going to have another annual Halloween party. We had a blast last year. Uh, we bring in multiple guests, and we'll still do a two-hour, like seven to nine. And uh, we're going to tell astronomy-related Halloween stories, and they get pretty good. We'll have door prizes, so be prepared to be amazed and terrified. So <laughs> please, please join in. Carol, what are you laughing at? <laughs> I like your style, Terry. <laughs> That's <very Terrifying>. cool. <laughs> please join us on the 28th. And we will uh, announce uh, what guests, I think we had six or seven different guests last year, and that's what we'll plan on doing this year. So we will be announcing all the guests probably. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. Next month, we'll announce it on the GSP, Scott. <laughs> so we'll, okay. and we'll be announcing it there. So, all right. If nobody else has anything else they would like to share, um, if you do, speak up now. No. Thank you again to Brent and Molly and Carol and Scott and John and if I David, thanks to everyone and thank you out there watching. We hope you join us for a Halloween party. It will be a good time. So thank we you. will see you in October. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.